but coming back to this text thy will be done means Lord I'm not going to be a rebel any longer and you see there are lots and lots of people who say the Lord's Prayer regularly every day or every week but they have never realized what they're committing themselves to I have found that a person will never have deep, settled, permanent, inward peace until they've made a total submission to Almighty God. This is what Isaiah says. And there's a reference there. Compare Isaiah 57. Isaiah the 57th chapter, verses 19 through 21. We're not going into the background of this. The Lord is speaking. And he says, I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him that is far off and to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will heal it. God is offering peace and healing to all mankind. To him that is afar off is usually a form of speech for the Gentiles. To him that is near to Israel. You'll find Paul takes up these references in Ephesians. God is offering peace and healing. But there are those that can never receive peace because they will never lay down their arms of rebellion. And so God goes on to say, but the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. As long as there's that attitude of rebellion, it's like something that we see in the sea. It cannot rest. It's continually uh, its waves are continually rolling, it's breaking, it's casting up the mire and the dirt at the edge. You watch the sea, it cannot rest. And the scripture says the wicked, the rebellious, are like the troubled sea, they cannot rest. There is no peace to the wicked. The, sh the, the best single evidence that you are living right is that you have deep, settled, abiding, inward peace. And I'll tell you today in modern America, there are very, very few people that have that. I was in uh, New Zealand with some Baptist friends there. They were talking about their Sunday school class. It was a college age class. And there was a young woman who was a trained nurse who came into the class didn't profess to be a Christian but wanted to study and this lady was her teacher the lady in whose house we were staying the Baptist lady and she said one day this young woman challenged her and said you talking to us about joy and peace the fruit of the Holy Spirit she said I'll believe that when I'm not continually giving sedation and tranquilizers to the members of your church that I visit in their homes but if you have joy and peace why all the sedation? Why all the tranquil arms? It doesn't go together, and that's the truth. There are very, very, very few people in modern America that have real, deep, settled, inward peace. You know why? Because it's a nation of rebels. Many times religious rebels, but rebels. And I believe there's coming a confrontation, a showdown between God and the people of the United States in this decade in which we're living. I envisage it. I see it in my spirit. And I praise God for it. And the real question will be total submission. After all, if God is willing to come into my life and share with me, there's only one logical place I can give him, and that is total supremacy. Complete lordship. Anything short of that is quite illogical. Now, let's go further back, and this is the second phase of our study today. We, we find ourselves confronted with the fact of rebellion. Rebellion inside us, rebellion in the world, rebellion against government, rebellion against God, rebellion of children against parents, students against teachers, and so on. Everywhere you look, you see rebellion, and it's burgeoning and increasing. When did rebellion begin? Who was the first rebel? Now, I'm going to seek to begin to answer these questions now, but I have to lay a foundation. There are two basic facts concerning Scripture and its revelation which we need to recognize. Let's try and look at them briefly right now. First of all, 
The Bible deals primarily with the Adamic race. This is a very important fact which few Christians have really grasped. In the first chapter of the Bible, the 26th verse, we have the creation of Adam. And what you have to remember is Adam is a proper name. And almost, I would say, 98% of the remaining teaching of Scripture relates to the descendants of Adam. Whenever you read in the Old Testament, the sons of men, it is actually the sons of Adam. It's a proper name. Uh, and the, the Bible's focus is on a certain man, Adam, and his descendants. And as I will seek to show you in a little while, there is nothing that I know of in Scripture to suggest that Adam was the only person of a human type that ever lived on the earth. In fact, I think it's almost inevitable that we have to acknowledge there were other races before Adam. But the Bible does not deal with them. The Bible is a revelation given to the Adamic race to tell us the things that we need to know for our spiritual benefit and good. Now, there are other facts, but they're really like the frame around the picture. The picture is Adam and his descendants and God's dealings with them. The other things that are revealed, and we're going to look at some of them, are not so much the picture as the frame, but we have to get the frame right in order to get the picture right. But we bear this in mind then. The Bible is speaking to Adam. Let me just point this out, which I'm going to deal with at length later on. When Jesus came, one of his main titles was the Son of Man. Actually, he gave himself that title more than 80 times in the Gospel. Now, the Son of Man is a direct translation from Hebrew, Ben Adam, which is the son of Adam. Adam, Adam. So he deliberately declared himself to be the son of Adam. And the Apostle Paul calls him the last Adam. In other words, he was identified with one specific man and his descendants. This is the most remarkable fact. It's a breathtaking thought that God has taken so much trouble about Adam. But there it is. The second thing which also goes with this is that there was an undetermined period in the history of the universe before the creation of Adam. And I'm not interested to measure it. It could be millions of years. It could be billions of years. In my opinion, years probably really aren't relevant to measuring that period. There are various passages in the Bible which suggest the elapse of almost measureless ages. There are also passages in the Bible which suggest that measureless ages still lie in front of us. But for the most part, the Bible does not focus on them. But the suggestion, in fact, I would say the clear indication is there in the Scripture. And we will not properly see things in focus unless we acknowledge this. Now, uh, for the remainder of our study now, I want to take a look at what I have called here in your outline the pre-Adamic period. You see, this is a very, what shall I say, egocentric classification. Uh, but I'm not capable of any other. From God's point of view, there will probably be many, many successive periods prior to Adam. But I'm looking at it from our little point of view and saying, well, before we ever came on the scene, who knows? There was something going on a long, long, long time. And I just call that whole long, long, long time, the pre-Adamic period. But if we could see it as God sees it, we'd probably classify it and subdivide it and have many different periods and ages to speak about. Now let's turn to the opening verse of Scripture, which is one of those tremendous statements that never loses its impact. If there was really only one verse in the Bible, and it was Genesis 1-1, I would have to acknowledge that it was inspired. To me, that speaks with authority. Uh, even as an unbeliever and a skeptic, I never could get away from the fact that there was some authority here which one day or another I was going to have to face up to, and in due course I did. In the King James Version we have this statement, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. In the opening chapters of Genesis, there are certain words that are in the plural form that are very interesting. You see, uh, in the English language, normally to make a noun plural we add S, don't we? Book books, job, jobs, and so on. 
Now, the normal plural in Hebrew, not the only one, but the normal one is adding two letters, I am, which are pronounced im. And im is the normal plural form in Hebrew. Now, in this very first verse, we have two words ending in e. I'll say the verse in Hebrew because it sounds good. Bereshi, bara, Elohim, et hashamayim, dehaaretz. Did you hear the two e's? Bereshi, in the beginning, bara created Elohim, God. The word for God, the first time in scripture, is plural. And there's a perfectly good singular form of that word, it's Eloa. You have an immediate conflict of grammar, because the Hebrew verbs have a plural and a singular form all through. But the, the, the verb bara is in the singular. So you have a conflict of grammar, a plural God, singular created. Which is, if, I, if you want to call it a mystery, it's the mystery of the Trinity in a nutshell. In God, there is both plurality and unity. The noun is plural, but the verb is singular, which is the whole mystery of the Trinity presented in the very first statement of God in the Scripture. Then you have the word heaven, et ha shamayim, and e is plural, not heaven, but heavens. And then aretz, aretz, the earth, is singular. So we have a plurality in God and a plurality in heaven. And, of course, the Bible indicates very, very clearly, as we'll see even maybe today and anyhow in subsequent studies, that there is more than one heaven. But all this is contained in the initial revelation. Two other words which are interesting that are also plural, that one, first of all, is hayim, which is life. He breathed into him the breath of life. The word is hayim. And we find, as we go on through Scripture, there are various forms of life. There's spiritual life, physical life, uh, mortal life, and immortal life. All these things are contained there. Another interesting word that's in the plural in uh, Hebrew is Mitzrayim, which is the word for Egypt. Because in Scripture, and in fact throughout history, there was upper and lower Egypt. Another interesting word that's plural is the word for water, Mayim. And the Bible indicates there's more than one kind of water. There's living water and natural water. There's water above the heaven and water under the heaven. See, in every case where the word is in the plural form, there's a reason for it. A revelation is contained even in that grammatical fact that the noun is in the plural. So here we have the very beginning of everything. God created the heavens and the earth. Now, other passages of scripture indicate that God created the heavens first and the people that were to inhabit the heavens, then he created the earth. The heavens and their inhabitants were already created when earth was created. Now we look at two scriptures that bring this point out. Uh, turning to the book of Job, the 38th chapter, Job 38 and reading just verses 4 through 8. Job had been, uh, you might say, arguing with the Lord at a distance, complaining that God wasn't running the universe right and wasn't treating Job right and things were getting out of hand and he was wishing that he could have a personal interview with the Lord. And in the midst of all this, the Lord suddenly appeared in person on the scene and Job got the shock of his life, if I may put it that way. And the Lord started to ask Job a lot of questions that Job couldn't answer. And uh, we'll just read some of these questions, uh, beginning at verse 1 and then skipping a little bit. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, saying, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee an answer by me. I'm going to ask you some questions, Job. You be ready with the answers. And Job said later, I'll lay my hand upon my mouth. I've spoken once but never again. That I was talking like a man who didn't know what I was talking about. All right, here are the questions, just a few of them. Verse 4, where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Well, Job would have to say, I wasn't there. Declare, if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? No, Lord, I don't. Who hath stretched the line, the architect's line upon it, to measure out each portion of it? Oh, Lord, I didn't do it. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or what are the sockets of the earth embedded into in modern English? Who laid the cornerstone thereof? 
when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Notice that when the Lord laid the foundations of the earth, the morning stars sang and the sons of God shouted for joy. Now the sons of God in Job without any question are the angels. So that when God laid the foundation of the earth, the angels were all watching. Heaven and its hosts were complete. And then all heaven enjoyed the wonderful spectacle of the Lord creating the earth. This is clear, and I believe there's nothing in us that wouldn't agree with this. It's, it's logical. It's reasonable. Then there's another passage there. You'll see in your note outline, compare Nehemiah 9.6. It's rather a strange place to look for this revelation. Many of us wouldn't think it would be in Nehemiah, but it is. The ninth chapter of Nehemiah is a tremendous chapter. It gives an outline of God's dealings with man and with Israel up to the time of Nehemiah. And it's tremendous, beautiful language. But we will just take the sixth verse of the ninth chapter of Nehemiah. Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven the heaven of heavens with all thy hosts, the earth and all things that there are therein, the seas and all that is therein, and thou preservest them all. Notice two things here. Thou hast made heaven the heaven of heavens. And that phrase is used also in the book of Psalms. Uh, there is a heaven which is as far above the heaven that we see as the heaven that we see is above earth. See, there's a heaven that's the heaven of the heavens. And God made them all. And the scripture says that God lives even above that. He lives above the heavens. He humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and on earth. So we find again the justification for the statement that heaven is plural. There is more than one heaven. We'll find further detail about this later on. But God, when he made the heaven and the heaven of heavens, also made their host, all those that were to dwell in them, the company of heaven, I believe it says in one of the passages in the Episcopal Prayer Book, all the company of heaven, and it's a rather beautiful and vivid phrase. Now, turning back to Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, uh, let's notice the next verse, verse 2. And I want to say immediately... I want to make this statement and then seek to substantiate it that I believe there is an unmeasured lapse of time between Genesis 1 verse 1 and Genesis 1 verse 2. And that time could be thousands of years, it could be millions of years, it could be in, a, in figures that we wouldn't know how to measure. See, another interesting fact, and I was particularly interested in this as a philosopher, is that it's meaningless to talk of time unless you have a standard of measurement. Now, when we talk of time, our standard of measurement is the movement of the sun and the heavenly bodies and things related to it. But uh, who knows how God measures time? See? In other words, it's, it's impossible actually for us to use meaningful words about a period before the human race existed in the measurement of time. And what I respect about the Bible is it never makes a wrong statement in that regard. If it had been purely a human work written with the knowledge of that time, they would have made many statements that would not stand the test of logic, but there's not one in the Bible that I know of. All right, we read then verse 2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And then it says the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The picture is of a bird hovering. The Spirit of God hovered like a dove upon the dark face of the deep. But what I am now declaring to you is this, that the description of the earth given in verse 2 is not a description of the earth in the state in which God created it. It's a description of the earth into a state in which it fell as a result of things that happened between verse 1 and verse 2. Now the word that's translated was could equally well be translated became. And I think that's the correct translation. I'm not saying that it's only translated became. Either is an accurate translation. But you'll see that I have put there in the outline, the earth became waste and void. And then in brackets, or in parenthesis, as you say, we have the two Hebrew words, tohu and bohu. Um, in Hebrew, tohu va bohu which uh, obviously designed to go together. And various languages tend to do this. I mean, we have in, uh, in English the word harem scarum. I don't really want to know what it means, but the, the rhyme is... And in Russian, which I once 
studied and learned the, the word for Russian phrase for upside down is shiburit navibrit, see? Where the shiburit and the vibrit rhyme. It's exactly really like tohu nabohu. It's a, it's a kind of way of saying a terrible condition, all upside down, all hair and scarum. In fact, you see, there's a feeling in language that this describes a situation. Now, for the remainder of this study, I want to go through with you the other places in the Old Testament where these same Hebrew words are used, tohu and bohu. And in the outline that follows, you'll find I have given every place where these two words are used. There are only two other passages where both words are used together, tohu and bohu. And they're given there. The first one is Isaiah 34 and verse 11. Isaiah 34, 11. Now, if you look into the background of this 34th chapter of Isaiah, it's a very vivid picture of God's judgment on the territory of Edom. Edom is the name given to Esau and his descendants. That is Jacob's twin brother. It's the country east of the Dead Sea. And the scripture indicates that at the close of this age, there will be a terrible, desolating, permanent judgment of God upon that area, a judgment of which the effects will remain, that we don't need to go into this, but it's going to be judged in a way that will, it will not just dry up, it will be a perpetual monument of God's judgment for all successive ages. And we'll see some of the phrases that are used. Uh, for instance, verse 8 of Isaiah 34, it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. The streams thereof shall be turned into pitch and the dust thereof into brimstone and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. This is a terrible, fearful judgment. Uh, it shall not be quenched night or day, the burning pitch. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever. This refers to the actual physical area east of the Dead Sea. This is an interesting fact, but it's not relevant to our immediate study, and therefore I have to be a little careful I don't get too far off on it, because it interests me. Now, let, look at verse 11. But the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it, the owl also and the raven shall dwell in it, unclean birds and beasts. And he, God, shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. Now, this is a metaphor from the architect's measuring line and his plummet. With the measuring line, he measures horizontally. With the plummet, he measures vertically. And God's judgment is summed up in this vivid phrase. It will be the measuring line of confusion and the plummet of emptiness. But the words in Hebrew are tohu and bohu. The measuring line of tohu and the plummet of bohu. In other words, what is it going to be? Total desolation. Completely given over to desolation that will be a memorial of God's judgment forever afterwards. The whole picture is one of God's anger and wrath visited in a desolating judgment. Now the other place where these two words are found together is in Jeremiah 4 and verse 23. Jeremiah the fourth chapter and the 23rd verse. Now again, the association of these words is with judgment. The judgment here relates to Israel. And uh, in verse 22 of Jeremiah 4, God says about Israel, My people is foolish. They have not known me. They are sottish children. They have none understanding. They are wise to do evil. But to do good, they have no knowledge. Total rebellion and wickedness. God, then Jeremiah is given a vision of judgment to come. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light without form and void, tohu and bohu. So again, a picture of complete desolation as a result of God's judgment upon wickedness. So the, the only three places where these two words occur together, Genesis 1, 2, Isaiah 34, 11, Jeremiah 4, 23. And I think we have to say that the consistent picture given is a fearful scene of desolation brought about by God's judgment upon terrible wickedness. And I believe that this is the truth about Genesis 1-2. It depicts a scene of desolation brought about by God's judgment upon terrible wickedness. Now, 
let's uh, just go quickly through the other passages where tohu is used without bohu. And I think we'll not need to turn to them all. They are listed there, and if you want to study them for yourself, you can do. But I have given not all the passages here, but a number of them. Deuteronomy 32.10, it says about the Lord that he found Jacob in a waste howling wilderness. The word waste is tohu. The whole picture is desolation. In Job 6.18, it speaks about streams in the desert that dry up and just run out into sand and, and offer nothing to anybody. It says they go to nothing. The word is tohu, perish. They just dry up into the sand. In Job 12.24 and Psalm 107.40, we have the phrase repeated, a wilderness where there is no way. And in each case, men upon whom God's judgment has come are made to wander in this wilderness where there is no way. The word wilderness is tohu. Then in Isaiah 24.10, which is a picture of judgment, we might look quickly at that, the 24th chapter of Isaiah. Uh, notice the first verse of this chapter is a picture of judgment on the whole earth. Isaiah 24.1, The Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. And then, as part of this total judgment, it says, The city of confusion is broken down. Confusion, total. A city of absolute desolation as a result of God's judgment. Isaiah 40.23, since we're in Isaiah, we can turn quickly to these scriptures. Isaiah 40.23, it says, The Lord bringeth the princes to nothing. He maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. Vanity, tohu. They are just consumed in his anger and wrath and judgment. And then in Isaiah 41.29, Speaking about worshippers of idols, it says they are all vanity, their works are nothing, their molten images are wind and confusion. Confusion, tohu, the object of God's wrath and judgment. And then the clearest statement of all, Isaiah 45, 18. Look at this one for a moment if you can. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it, he created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. In vain, tohu. So read tohu there and you see what you get. He created it not tohu. So if in Genesis 1-2 it was tohu, then it wasn't in that condition that God created. This is, I think, absolutely um, unanswerable logic. So the situation in Genesis 1-2 where the earth was tohu and bohu was not the condition in which the Lord created. He did not create a world that was tohu or bohu. He created it to be inhabited. His aim was to make a blessed, pleasant, wonderful place for people to dwell in. The fact that it became tohu and bohu indicates that a judgment of God had descended upon the earth between its creation as recorded in Genesis 1-1 and the scene presented in Genesis 1-2.